Hey everybody, I'm uh, Martins, uh, co-founder and CPO at SonarWorks, and we're here with uh, Dana Nielsen, our longtime user and uh, friend, and uh, we're here to chat about uh, music technology and cool stuff. Yeah, I love it. So, hey. Welcome. I'm so glad you guys are here. Well, it's great to be here. <laughs> How are you? <laughs> great, great. So uh, why don't you start with telling us a little bit about yourself? How did you get into music? What is it that you most love about it currently? What stuff yeah. you've been working on? And Sure. I'm originally and still a saxophone player. That's uh -huh. my main instrument. Grew up playing piano and then switched to saxophone in the fourth grade and took that all the way through college uh, where I was a jazz major at Loyola University. Okay. Um, my wife went there as well. She's a singer and um, we're high school sweethearts. Very sweet. Nice. Um, and um, yeah, in college I, I started doing work in the studio. Um, and I became the teacher assistant, got my own set of keys where I would run labs for the other students and also run my own sessions all night long. Right. <laughs> <laughs> and really cut my teeth there and realized how much I love being in the studio. Honestly, uh -huh. I, I grew up wanting to be an astronaut and music was like my thing that, on the that side. That career took quite a turn there. It did. <laughs> you know, as I was like getting a, a, a C in, in like advanced physics as a freshman, okay. uh, I realized like, maybe I should do focus on the music part more. <laughs> but full circle, like once I found the studio and how much I love that, um, it was like it became my own little, you know, spaceship uh -huh. in there. And really, and the engineering side, the technical side, the math, the, the physics, the acoustics, yeah. and, and best of all, the sound, you know, that all kind of like came full circle. And uh, I still play saxophone and write a lot of music and perform when I can. But um, I'd say from that, moment uh, I really started focusing okay. on being a producer, a, a, a mixer, an engineer. So the saxophone is kind of uh, a little less than a half from your kind of uh, reality and personality and the studio is now grown to be a bigger part, right? Yeah, honestly it became really clear right away in the studio, even in college, that now if I'm useful to artists in the studio i'm still using my ears i'm still part of the music sure. but i don't have to you know ask this like country band that i love like can i play a sax solo on your song you know uh or this you know <laughs> rap group or rock group yeah. you know like all these this diversified taste that yeah. we all have being in the studio suddenly it felt like I can work on all of it, you know? And growing up in the 80s when saxophone solos were on like everything, it seemed like the perfect instrument, you know? By the time I'm in college in the mid to late 90s, it was like, well, there's not much saxophone anywhere unless you're, you know, playing bebop in, in New York, which I love, but uh, slim chances of me like really dominating that okay. space, you know? Makes sense. Um, so yeah, when I got in the studio with these different artists, even jazz artists, it just was like liberating to uh, dive into the technical component and listen to a ton of different music and have helpful opinions about it when, um, when I can and uh, not always have to be performing. And um, so I feel like now, you know, 20 years since then, I have a nice balance of playing, performing and plenty of like behind the glass. Sure. <laughs> and then you can stuff. also very much, I assume, relate to the musicians yes. that you're working with, right? That's been very helpful my whole career. Okay. Uh, being an engineer who like is a musician to, yeah. to not be obnoxious, but to help uh, translate <laughs> when, yeah. when needed, you yeah. know, um, it's, it's fun. So what uh, cool projects have you been working on in your career? What do you, what, what comes up as highlights? Uh, highlights, perceptions? well, there have been so many. Um, <laughs> um, I do a lot of work with Rick Rubin, um, who always has a million amazing artists around. And so it's been an incredible time working with him and kind of rubbing shoulders with so many legends and heroes of mine. Um, working with Bob Dylan on his Tempest album was completely crazy. Um, wow. in a wonderful way, like yeah. surreal crazy, yeah. <laughs> um, eating lunch together every day and, you know, <laughs> calling him Bob and, you know, looking through electronic musician magazine together, <laughs> just rando stuff. Um, you know, let's see, um, uh, my wife and I just worked on the new Post Malone album, Oh wow, that which was nice. really exciting. Um, we get to do a lot of collaborative work. Uh, okay. she's a vocal contractor and singer. 
Um, and so she's often tasked with putting together groups of singers to work mm -hmm. on projects. Um, and we've both done a lot of work with Republic and various artists um, on their roster. And like, so we, she got a call about this gig and oh, yeah. by the way, it's with Post Malone and we're just both like, whoa, crazy. Um, so yeah, um, that's a lot of fun and that just came out. So that feels really exciting. Um, Working with Neil Young, uh, a lot of like I get to work with a lot of actors as well in like the sort of film score world that I um, work in. So like uh, working with like Will Ferrell a bunch and Kristen Wiig and um, you know. So you seem to be working like all across the genres from Bob Dylan to Post Malone. There is yeah, kind of yeah. I did a Slayer album, uh, <laughs> oh, okay. you know. So like, <laughs> so all, it's got all over wide the, dynamic yeah. range creatively speaking. And honestly, like that's what I mean, like about the the studio. How I love all of these different styles of music, and um, that's one of my favorite bits is being able to like jump from different genres, yeah. and um, I love that. Yeah. Awesome. <laughs> About the studio, and if you have an awesome room here, it's uh, super nice. Uh, did you design and build it yourself, or how did you no. uh, how did you come to have such a wonderful? Place? Well, um, actually, it was I think while I was working on that Slayer album, Carissa, my wife, was doing the house hunting. We were looking to move from Santa Monica to Culver City, where we're at, <clears throat> have a bit more space. Uh, at the time, my studio in Santa Monica was also in our house. I've always had a home studio, and I've always done all of my mixing from the home studio, even when the previous one was about the size of this carpeted space. <laughs> it was like a five-by-five five small extra bedroom. So moving here to this space, which is like four times the size of that room, um, Carissa was house hunting, saw this room and uh, was right away like, oh, Dana's going to want this for the studio. And obviously it's supposed to be a master bedroom. And she is amazing for, um, you know, donating it to our larger studio needs. Um, but yeah, the, it was like this when we moved in about 12 or 13 years ago. And love the open A-frame. We immediately contacted our... Um, friends uh, Jacques Lacroix and Vincent Van Hoff who came in and, and checked out the space and uh, designed their, their signature shovel which is what they call this piece here and um, we worked on these polys on the sides and um, this back wall there's actually another modular piece that for years was fit in the window there and at some point I thought like let me just see if I can get that window back and um, surprisingly, it, yeah, it didn't really, uh, to me, in any way, affect the, the mixing sound. And then similarly, like, I kept using this fold-open closet for vocals. Uh -huh. uh, and I would, just like I've done in lots of home studio installations with Rick, you know, make, constantly making um, makeshift acoustic spaces and um, one of the tricks that is very common um, for drums you know you build like this uh, sort of gobos behind and then you know you can put two by fours over those yeah. gobos and drape a lot of um, packing blankets and things like that to really so you still get some reflections and room going out this way but all of this stuff the reflections are really damp. All right let's talk about uh, sound like uh, how important is like uh good quality of sound for you when you do your work? On one hand, my work is sound, and yes. I love it, and I'm always striving for the best sound, even when, to me, sometimes the best sound is degraded um, uh, on purpose, and that's, that's a lot of fun. Um, but so yeah, I love sound, I live for sound, um, but that's not to say I poo-poo things that sound funky. Um, the other thing I always say, like, don't be snobby. I've, I've learned from, I kind of like, um, really have worked on so many of these high level albums uh -huh. where there's rental budget and there's food budget and there are setup days and, or setup days upon days, um, and pre-production and, um, you know, get whatever is needed to capture this in the most fidelic and comfortable for the musicians type of way to then switch to uh, working in like 
TV and advertising, yeah. Carissa and I do a lot of music um, for ads and work with a group of composers who do a lot of music for that. That stuff, you know, once I started um, working with them 10 or 12 or 15 years ago, their process is really fast. And they would hire me to record and mix and just be like, Dana, are you done with like drum sounds? It's been 10 minutes. Like, <laughs> like what gives, you know? And to me, I'm like, Should have been this done. would be like a half a day or a day, you sure. know? Like, yeah. um, and so it took a while to kind of like, shed that sort of skin and just because I had to because I was hired by them and this was the job and this sure. is how they do things like okay I guess well I haven't checked the phase on these things and there's only a you know 57 as an overhead and yeah. you know so we and oh, it's fine oh. I'm used to in the in the bigger album experience yeah. setting up drums you know, having a setup day uh, working on sounds for even just the drums you know for mm -hmm. many hours uh, but in the like ad space and music for a tight turnaround that's just impossible and it took a while to you know roll with that and at first i kind of had to and sort of begrudgingly well okay i mean i can't vouch for these sounds you know and then to come to find out like those are some of the best sounds you know you're you're under pressure you've got um subpar you know equipment like you know uh maybe the the 421 that's got the grill knocked off mm -hmm. and you, you know like it, it's ta duct taped onto the stand and you know like what's the use in being like i can't work in these conditions you know where's my 251 you know <laughs> it just through all of those times and uh discovering what fun it is to work with um limitations and for sake of speed and creativity yeah. Um, it's really been eye-opening over the years. It's, it's not only taught me, like, you don't need the best of the best gear to get amazing results. Um, it's certainly fun and helpful, but you definitely don't. It's also, you know, uh, encouraged, like, creativity and trying different mics yeah. on different things. Um, and it's also increased my speed and efficiency in those bigger budget album places you know yeah. um because there are definitely times where you think you have a day to set up yeah. and all of a sudden it's like hey the artist al uh, like landed today and uh -huh. they want to come in and blah 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 like yeah. okay yeah no worries let's We're, go <laughs> i can sit here and tinker with stuff until the cows come home if i know we've got a day to, to sure. set up but we're already ready i'm just kind of you know a lot of my work in the like bigger album space yeah. is meticulous setup um, and, and sometimes practicing moves, you know, okay, we've, we've maxed out the tie lines, we've maxed out the console. We want to have you know, not, not just the grand piano, but we've got an upright, we've got a tack piano, and we've got a grand out in the living room. Like, wh how are we going to facilitate this? Okay, well, we're going to switch the console from mic to line, we'll use these external pre's, we've got lines run here. If I say go, let's practice this. You guys pull those patches, put it into here, whatever. Okay, um, that's cool. That works. You up. know, just kind of like, kind of like uh, somebody once compared it to like a military drill or something. You know, like just being so ready when the talent arrives. It's like arrives. changing the Formula One tires. Yeah, it's like that type of stuff. You know, just um, uh, of course it's it's lower lower stakes certainly sure. than military. Uh, <laughs> but you know, like we like to say, there's no. There's no such thing as a music emergency. We all feel like yes. there is, but it's, it's, it's just music. You but know? So for you then, obviously having here he, these very nice ATCs with Sound ID reference calibration, yeah. how does, like, what difference does that bring to you compared to when you had a like, studio the size of your carpet and, I yeah. don't know, let's say a pair of KRKs or... On one hand, I, this type of setup with the ATCs and the Sound ID reference allows me to be very accurate and to correct room reflections, to save time in the long run uh, with fewer fixes going to the car or other systems. Um, I can hear an extended low end and top end. Mm -hmm. So there's more information I can work with to make decisions. Um, but in the same kind of don't be snobby type of ethos, um, when I was in that five by five, carpeted square you know box and working on these five inch Yamahas um, I still 
believe much in the same way people love NS10s. Yes. I think that you know, 90% of the work is done in in that small pocket that most speakers can can do. Um, whether or not they're flat is another story, but that sort of like mid-range energy is really uh, what's going to help translate across a lot of stuff. Um, and to that end, like I, I still work on these tiny, tiny little realistic yeah. powered speakers. You even work on them or you oh. just mix check on them? Oh, no, I work on them oh, constantly. Wow. Yeah, okay. constantly. Um, because I can, I can really find the power of a mix in those. Here, there's power for days. Yes. You know, it's built into the, the system. Um, and it's easy to crank up and be blown away and washed over by sound and stereo image and um, deep bass and sparkly highs and think that you're, you're getting an accurate picture uh -huh. in that meaty mid-range area. Yeah. On something like here or on a cell phone speaker or a computer, which is why I'm excited about the, the new stuff um, in Sound ID Reference where you can simulate those sounds. Yes. That's critical because all of that simulation has to do with that little pocket, that main 90% pocket of energy that has to translate. So, um, you know, I look at, and I'm guilty of it too occasionally, like I'll look at uh, TikTok videos of people making songs uh, or demoing a plugin and it's on a, a bass patch or something. You can't like, bro, you can't hear anything you're doing on this phone. Uh -huh. It defeats the purpose, you know? And that's what stuff like those speakers will do. Like, it's in those areas that you can't hear that you still need to hear them, you yeah. know, psychoacoustically or put some harmonic stuff on there to get it up into the listenable, audible range on, uh -huh. a, on a small speaker like that. Um, and I also keep them deliberately closed to mono, so, and they're, they're away from me. So you kind of get a number of things. You get this listening from another room perspective, which is, we all have had that experience sure. and it's always revealing, you know, you put on a song that you've made and you go in the other room and you're like, oh my gosh, like, I didn't realize it sounded like that or that's way too loud or that, whatever. So having them away from me is really helpful. Um, having them pushed together is really helpful because I'm not, you know, transfixed by this stereo image sure. and any like stereo stuff I'm doing. Um, and then just the fact that they have such a limited bandwidth is really helpful. So what my goal is, is working on those. I'll always start here and okay. I'll crank it up and I leave myself plenty of headroom in Pro Tools so that I can ride faders and really just feel inspired and loving the low end and the, you know, the, the fixed, you know, room acoustics and all that stuff. And just like, it's fun. It's just pure inspiration. And then when I feel like I have a cool balance going and maybe even a little bit of automation, then I'll move over there and I kind of live there for a while and make the most banging, you know, on these little speakers, you know, make the most like slamming, you know, compelling mix I can. Or if it's not a slamming style of music, just make it feel, make it feel full top to bottom on those. And then my goal is to then I pop over to, to the main system and uh, it's immediately revealing. It should, when it's done, feel like this is just a bigger, louder yes. version of that. But um, invariably what happens is you do all this work to get the low end cranking on the little speakers. And then you come over here and it's like way out of control on the subs. Mm -hmm. And then it's just like, okay, well I know this, I, this is how I want it to sound mm -hmm. on the little speakers yeah. and ear pods and phones and all that stuff. Now all I gotta do is correct it on here. Okay. So, so that it, it doesn't damage what I got going over there and still feels impactful in the low end. Okay. So it just kind of like takes a whole lot out of the equation for but, a while. For but me. So would you say having good reference sound on these speakers when you first work on the material kind of unleashes the creativity? Absolutely. Absolutely. And, you know, I don't get fired up listening uh -huh. over there. Sure. <laughs> um, similarly, I think, again, that's why people historically love the NS10s. It's like it's not thrilling to you have to do a lot of work yes. to make it thrilling to listen yeah. on speakers like that and that's why people you know mixers at least use them because you get a lot of that work done listening here with the sound id reference and everything uh dialed that is just creative inspiration for the beginning and for the end like when at the end and i can crank it up 
and know that I'm not getting zinged with a bunch of like rough frequencies up top and, and I'm not hearing the, <clears throat> I love that it's got the corrections on the bottom. For example, from the, the day we moved in here and got the studio yeah. going, there is a, and this is honestly, this is why I started using. I was just about to, get, yeah. about to ask. <laughs> so this is why I was initially drawn and still am drawn to the to, um, sound ID reference is that I knew there, 147 is a, is a magic number in this room. Uh -huh. 147 hertz resonates <laughs> like a, a big old pain in the ass. Um, it's, <laughs> fortunately, it's very narrow. It's okay. very specific to 147. So much so that these days I know the sound of that, that the pitch of that frequency. Yeah. But also as I'm mixing, whether it comes up in the you know upper harmonics of a bass or um, the lower chest of a vocal, a uh, certain vocalist in a certain key will just like light up the room. And, and, I'll, and I'll be like, I know it's got to be that 147. I'll put on an EQ. Okay. I, I'm real quick to just tighten up the bandwidth, sweep around with without looking at it. I find it, you know, like there it is. Look, check 147 it. for yeah. sure. So having something that deals with that um, is exhilarating. Um, fortunately, by experience, before I had Sound ID Reference, I was notching that out i would do that tight bandwidth find that super resonance and just you know turn it down turn it turn it down again super super tight you know as tight as the bandwidth will go and i found that like i don't miss it mm -hmm. I don't, i'm never like in the car you know man 147 is my jam you know like where <laughs> is it on this mix you know it's it's just like for me at least the way that so, i so deal on with your it. mixes you just kind of can identify yeah. them by like lack of 147 yeah, well hopefully it's not mix wide i'm talking about like on a vocal that's a particular person in this particular key uh -huh. if i just notch that out super tight i never miss it you know um so fortunately the natural if i were to fix it with eq it doesn't tend to bite me elsewhere where I feel like something's mixing, missing, but how much better to have a tool that's going to do that for me. And, and then you don't have to And then I don't have to about do it. it. I don't have to worry about it. Um, so that's how I initially five years ago or maybe more like started, yeah. um, saw, uh, I can't remember who it was, a, a friend posted about it and I was like, what? and uh, checked it out and you know how gratifying for any like audio nerd to know there's an issue right find you Solution. know this product do the measurement thing it's like right there it's right there on the graph <laughs> 147 i knew it and i knew it you know and then to see that correction curve you know where it's like there it is and it's uh -huh. just notching that out so um and i noticed i love on i haven't tried it yet but i love on the new version how you can um, sweep, like make a range yes. for yourself. You, ha you can have a lot more that's freedom really, to customize yeah, the target curve that's if you really, cool. really know you what know? you're doing. So, have you had any uh, situations now when you collaborate over distance, I would imagine, that you have, Tons. right? <laughs> Tons. I really like it. Um, you know, the pandemic really forced that upon all of us. I was doing some of that already for um, remote mix approvals and things yes. like that. So I, I thankfully already had some of the tools to do that type of stuff. Um, and it's just gotten better and better. I've got a lot of different work, work um, a lot of different workflows. Uh -huh. um, I work with the Avert brothers a lot and they're in North Carolina. Okay. And we were slated to do um, a bunch of new recording right when the pandemic hit and um because i'd been to their home studio before doing demos mm -hmm. um on other records uh i knew their studio and i knew that they were using apollo stuff okay. as their interface and i knew that i'm like wait a minute we could i could like team viewer into your computer and watch you on zoom and tell you where to put mics okay. and i could set the gains and the you know sure. compression straight to pro tools you just need you know i told them the software that i use this nexus um software to, to stream it back to me okay. high quality real time and 
away we went. So what would be like for somebody who's just getting into music production or mixing, what would be your three key tips or advice to somebody who's just starting out? What would you be? What would you say? Um, <coughs> key to success. Key to success. Um, I do have a little like mix. I call it my five mix power tips PDF. That's a freebie. Oh, you've already uh, put it. Yeah. In written. <laughs> I do. Yeah. Uh, I think it's uh, like uh, studiopowertips.com is my little like you know giveaway thing. Um, and I'm trying to remember what all five of those are, and I'm not sure if they would all be starting out people. Well, one of them is the don't be snobby. It's okay. that kind of ethic. Like, don't be afraid if if you don't have the equipment that you dream of. You can do it, like these days, you can do it on anything, you know, maybe it's GarageBand that's mm -hmm. built into your computer or, you know, FL Studio or, um, I mean, at live, like I use all of these things. Uh -huh. um, and so I am I never pass judgment at gear um, because you can do anything with anything these days and it's all at such a price point for anybody. Um, it's awesome. So yeah, don't be afraid, uh, don't be snobby, don't be afraid if you can't you know, get the, the most awesome gear that you want yet. The other thing is like, you know, people ask me all the time, um, I really am not confident about how to use an EQ or how to use a compressor or some of the, the tools or if I'm, um, I'm, I'm making this mix of this new song and, I, and it's cool and it sounds cool, but I just, I don't know what I'm doing. So what do I do? And I'm like, if, if it sounds cool, you're doing it, right. you know, like you don't have to know all this stuff. Like if you can open up an EQ and twist some knobs and it makes it sound cooler, uh -huh. there's your answer. You know, like right. that's literally all I'm doing. You yeah. know, um, it can feel super overwhelming to somebody new at it because it looks, t it is technical and there, there are plenty of you know, snobs on the internet, you know, saying you can't do this and you sh sure. should only do that. And, you know, if it sounds good, it's good. Sounds good. It's good. You know, like if you think your mix sounds cool and it makes you excited, you know, then it, then it's cool. You know, that's not to say that I can't help you in, improve upon it, uh, in a way that you wish it had more this or sure. that. And maybe I can help you with some of that, but uh -huh. it's like, use your ears. That's all, all right. that's all, that's all I'm doing. That's all you need to do. So, solid advice. <laughs> <laughs> uh, let's talk about the trends in the industry. Yeah. Uh, surround sound, spatial audio certainly seems to be picking up. Totally. How do you feel about it? I'm excited about that. You know, to see, like, I don't, I don't imagine a lot of people, consumers, are going to have, you know, a 10 speaker Atmos setup in the right. living room. Um, or bedroom. Or bedroom. <laughs> uh, but if, if these companies are developing new kind of head headphone technology that can simulate that and it results in a new and thrilling way to listen to music outside of a cinematic experience like I'm I'm all I'm all ears um, <laughs> uh, so yeah I think it's something really exciting that a lot of people are, are jumping on I know labels are updating their deliverables for sure. this type of stuff and a lot of my mixer friends are jumping on and building systems and I've kind of um, held off a little bit on that. I've got my plate full with like other fun endeavors, even There's though they're still plenty of work to do in stereo. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and I love, I love stereo. I love multi-channel too. Like I had a whole five, one mix set up back in 2003 and was mixing in surround and, um, I love all of it. I'm excited about all of it. But for now, in this room, <laughs> I'm, I'm decidedly stereo for the moment. Makes sense. Yeah. And uh, you told you were also working a lot with, uh, or doing some work with uh, artist uh, royalties and everything. Mm. So you must have an opinion about NFTs. Yeah, yeah. You is know, that a cool thing? or? Uh, is I it think it's very promising. I, I wish I had my own NFT going crazy right now. Yeah. Um, but I'm excited about creators in the music space using using nfts um, to deliver stuff right to their listeners even on a small scale i mean i think that's the thing that's super exciting about it for now is that um anybody can get into it and create something um for their audience it's a lot of like what i've been working on the past couple of years 
is learning about building an audience um, and marketing and um, releasing records uh, digitally, physically, this whole other side of what happens after I'm done mixing or mastering or something like yeah. that. A question to which I've always been like, uh. <laughs> so I've really somebody been, does something somebody with. yeah you know like I'll mix an album for an independent artist and they'll be like this is great what do I do yeah. now and I'm like yeah, I don't know <laughs> right? I don't know but uh, so I really got curious about what happens next you know uh -huh. and uh, my wife and I started a label called Neon Tusk and um, just have a very very small roster at the moment but it's enough that I'm so you cover all the bases from like playing an instrument to yeah. monetizing the, yeah. the whole thing. And that's it. Really, um, I found an amazing community of um, independent musicians who are doing their best to monetize their craft. And it's such an incredible time to do that. It, like never before has there been easier access to the DSPs and, and sure. like NFTs and all the T's and P's. Um, there's just, and there's so many great people online. I take so many courses um, that I buy and learn from amazing people. And then there's so many courses that are free on YouTube and stuff. Um, and I, I will fall down a rabbit hole. <laughs> um, so I love it. I see people in that DIY indie music scene using those tools and even at a small scale to start like monetizing that stuff. Um, some people will use NFTs to offer a piece of the rights of that music. You know, other people make a very specific piece of music that's only that NFT that they still own or whatever. Mm -hmm. But just the idea that creators of any size could um, monetize their music directly to the end user. Um, is pretty fascinating, um, and I'm excited to watch, you know, streaming platforms like Audius and others like that are trying to utilize that technology. Um, awesome. Yeah. Well, um, seems there is exciting stuff happening, and uh, we have an interesting future ahead for the world of music. Right? Yeah, it really, it's really something. All uh, right. Well, hey, uh, thanks for the chat. It has thank been you. super interesting, and. Uh, yeah, yeah, awesome. Thank you. I, I love Sound ID Reference, and uh, it's it's really been a game changer over the years, and I love what y'all are doing, and uh, thank you for coming by. Awesome. So. <laughs> <laughs>